All right, Rocky, great to see you and um, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you. I really appreciate you being on our, our Leaders Who Care series, where we're trying to show that leaders actually can care and even do better, you know, in business and, and for community. And, um, you know, I, this is just going to be a confirmation of all the good things that your mom said about you. Just trying to, you know, make sure. <laughs> so, um, so can you um, start us off, you know, by kind of formally introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Absolutely. Well, thank you again for having me on the show. I manage a global team that's responsible for the strategy, implementation, and revenue of the digital sales development function at IBM. So uh, there's a few hundred sellers globally, and they are responsible for deal progression, closure of select deals, engaging with clients, all that good stuff. I've been at IBM for about a year and a half now. I was previously at Microsoft, where I had helped them to build their digital sales team as the chief of staff to the corporate vice president for the inside sales team. So it's one of the first employees on that team, helped hire 2,000 people in under three years. So wow. very passionate about building and growing high-performing teams. And then I'm also really passionate about diversity and inclusion and um, advancing women in business in particular. So um, I have the pleasure of serving as the executive co-chair of the Women at IBM group in New York City, as well as, um, you know, writing and doing keynote speeches and things on how we can get more women into sales. So really looking forward to sharing some of those topics today and having our discussion. Yeah, me too. Um, because we, we got a, our company launched at the UN with the Decade of Women initiative that we created. Oh, wow. So there's a lot of good stuff I think we can talk about. And uh, I just wish we had talked when you were hiring those 2,000 people, considering a big part of our business is executive search. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, One day. <laughs> I'd love to start with, um, everybody always talks about the why, and the why is so important, but I'll phrase it a different way is, why do you do what you do? Well, I think it's actually a very timely question because I've been rereading Simon Sinek's books, Start With Why. So I'm sure a lot of people have read it. Anyone who knows Simon Sinek basically knows that he deeply believes that if you lead with the why instead of the what, that's how you really inspire people and build and motivate teams. So having reread that book right now, it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. But in terms of my why, I mean, I think I do what I do because I want to leave everything I touch better than the way that I found it. It's pretty simple and I want to break barriers for women and other marginalized groups to make it easier for them than it was for me or for the women who came before me. I want to build and grow teams that matter. Um, and I wanted to work at a company whose why aligned with my own personal why. I think, um, you know, working at IBM, the why for IBM is very simple. It's to be essential and it's to create technology that changes the world and also to foster an environment of inclusion where everybody can succeed and be successful. We have a um, IBM Be Equal campaign, which is really focused on um, helping to get marginalized groups, um, you know, advanced in business leadership. So it's a gender equality initiative for everyone, by everyone, regardless of gender. And it's a big part of our company culture. So I'm really proud to be able to lead an environment where my why aligns with the why of the company that I'm working for. And I always encourage people to try to seek that out too. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. And I think, you know, one of the things we always profess too is, um, if you align your your brand with social impact, then you will be able to attract and develop and keep the best people because they'll be, not to name drop, but I was with Richard Branson at the end of 2019. And we ended up in a conversation about who says they're proud of where they work anymore. Yeah. <laughs> proud of where they work anymore. And, um, and some people say they like it or this, or that, but the word proud doesn't come up as often as it, as it used to. Um, but I think now people are asking the question about, do you really care about the environment? Do you really care about equality or equal opportunity? Do you really care about that to make a decision to join a company? Don't you? Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think the way people approach their career has changed drastically, even in the past 10 years before a job was a job. Now, I mean, people want to work for companies that are making a difference. And if we're spending at least a third of our life working, why wouldn't we want to be working somewhere that 
has deep meaning and value. And I think millennials in particular care a lot about that societal impact that you just described. I mean, as you can probably tell, I'm a millennial myself, but beyond my own personal opinion, um, there are a lot of studies out there, actually. I just recently read the Deloitte Millennial Study, which they do every year. They said 64% of millennials care about making a difference in the workplace. And so, um, you know, I think tying your company's mission to societal value is a really important way to stay relevant, competitive, to attract the best talent, especially with millennial employees. So you've, you've partially answered this, this question already, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you in any ways. You've, so you've been engaged in advancing women. Um, in a particular area, actually, sales that is not necessarily usual, per se, for women yeah. because of how we were taught and thought and all that before. Um, and, but you've also, you've also, you know, worked with companies to, you know, um, support them, advance them, et cetera, et cetera. And um, is that how you differentiate, differentiate yourself? Because you talked about your why, you talked about the company's why. And one of the things I've noticed is that the ones that are most successful are the ones that um, find a way to fit the individual's why or purpose with the company's why and purpose. How do you differentiate yourself as to, as to how you are within the workplace? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you said is definitely true. It is probably most directly tied to the work that I've done around um, addressing issues of diversity and inclusion, as you just mentioned, specifically for women and also particularly in sales. And uh, you know my mom, that's how we met. So I grew up with a single mom, two older sisters. My dad wasn't really in the picture. And you know, I mean, my mom is definitely a force of nature and she basically showed me that women can do anything. And, and there are systemic issues though and barriers that women face. So I think in order to change those, we need people, both women and men, um, to help us fight that fight, which is why I try to be a champion for it within my own field. Um, sales is not a, a place where there is a lot of good gender representation. In fact, um, only 39% of people in sales are women. That number has barely increased over the past decade. The higher up you get, the worse it is. Only one in five um, vice presidents of sales are women. We don't hear very much about it. We hear a lot about getting more girls and women into STEM, but sales is actually um, the, the, act, the industry that is the second largest gender equity gap behind supply chain within the business functions. So um, yeah, so I mean, I guess I've coached leaders and companies on why we need more women in sales, why women should consider roles in sales, and have offered them some tangible tips and tricks on things they can do a little bit differently, and um, really hope that other people are helping to try to move the needle within their own industries, too. Well, I find, you know, again, it's that training we've had about stereotypes, um, including, for example, the pharmaceutical industry getting good looking women to put it bluntly to do the sales that was a stereotype and that's where they fit and if you could describe why what's the difference between just maybe general sales of a product and digital sales and how women fit into that well, so basically, I mean, there's typically two different types of sales. So there's field sales, which is kind of your traditional sales environment where people are living in specific places. They have a territory. They're going to meet customers face to face. Digital sales is a rising industry, and that's basically inside sales or telesales, which was kind of the old school name for it, where you are engaging with clients from your home or from a work environment and you don't actually need to meet with them in person. A lot of companies um, are ramping up their digital sales efforts, not even because of the pandemic years before, because customer buying preferences have been shifting toward digital engagement. So it's a more cost effective way to be able to scale and reach a lot of clients at scale who don't necessarily want to meet face to face these days when they can do everything in more of a self serve environment. So I think because of that, it's actually um, it's a profession that's giving women a lot of flexibility. Um, sales in general, regardless if it's field or digital, it gives women a lot of flexibility. You can work from home, you can work at your own hours, you can engage in the way that you want to. And so I always encourage women to consider it as a viable and a worthwhile career path. But there's a lot of different reasons why there's a lot of preconceived notions about the profession being very masculine and um, that's one of the things why it's it's so important for customers and um, for 
for companies rather to be really specific and thoughtful about the verbiage they're using in job descriptions. There's still a lot of job descriptions in the industry that say we're looking for people who are hungry, aggressive, uh, you know, ready to do the killer sale or whatever. And I mean, those are words that most women would be very turned off by if they read it. And so we have to figure out how we make the entire process more inclusive to showcase that sales can actually be a great environment for people to thrive. Yeah, don't you find it kind of relates a little bit to the difference between just making a sale transactional and, and developing a relationship? Yeah. And because of that, I mean, I think women are actually naturally a very good fit for sales. There's plenty of studies out there that show that women are better at sales than men are. And part of it is because uh, I mean, we ask a lot of questions, we listen intently, we nurture. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things that people just, you know, a lot of women hold themselves back, unfortunately, but the more and more they learn about what sales as a cultural fit could be like, the more open-minded they are about it. And we just try to fix things and make the sale. That's our stereotype, right? <laughs> um, hey, you know, um, grandparents, uh, my grandparents um, were from Kiev, Ukraine, and they would always say, and I'm sure most grandparents said this, they would always say, um, you know, as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing. And then they'd say, and then there's education. That was the second thing. But it was health. And, you know, you're in a technology company. Um, it's zooming fast technology every day. Um, we have COVID-19, which we thought was the biggest problem we had in the world. But then we had another one just to add on to it with social justice. It was going to hit a tipping point. They all hit at the same time. So with all that said, um, don't you find people have had a little more time to think or what I would call have an awakening, if you will, about what's important to us in, in, in what we're doing. And I wanted to get your views on what you think our awareness is going to be in general when we're at work or at home or just in our community with everything that's going on now? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the past few months in particular have actually been some of the most defining moments of my entire lifetime. Of course, a lot of people mentioned September 11th. That was hugely defining for so many people. But for me at the time, I was actually still pretty young. So this moment in time has really been the tipping point for me and a lot of people in my generation. I mean, I think what's going on right now is an awakening on many fronts. We had a global pandemic, um, which completely upended everyone's lives, both professionally, personally, taking hundreds of millions of lives. Obviously, we had an awakening on racial injustice, as you just said, with the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, et cetera, protests all over the globe, people losing their job, a lot of stress, uncertainty, chaos. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a single person in the world who would say this too shall pass. I mean, I definitely think things will get better, but we won't just go back to our lives um, 2019 and prior. I think um, being a good leader, though, is focusing on the positives and the things that we can learn from this and the good that can come out of it. So for me personally, I've been thinking a lot about privilege um, and just the fact that I'm so privileged to be in the position that I am right now. I look around and I see so many different people who aren't necessarily. So I'm privileged to work at IBM. I mean, with what's going on right now, technology is really sustaining the digital operations of the world, whether that's healthcare or education or banks, you name it. Um, I'm privileged to be able to shelter in place. It means that I actually have a home to be do able to do it in. I'm privileged to be able to uh, have access to things like hand sanitizer and toilet paper and all these other things that people are hoarding, although I don't fully understand the hoarder mentality <laughs> on that one. Um, but it means that I have the money to be able to do it and access to things like Amazon or whatever that can bring it to my doorstep. Um, and I'm privileged to be able to work from home. Um, it means that I work at a company that allows the flexibility and I can stay safe. I mean, I have a sister who is a doctor who has to go physically um, to support her patients and is putting herself at risk. She has two kids. And so I just, I think um, part of being an effective leader who cares is taking a step back and acknowledging some of those um, positions of privilege that we're in and what we can do to, to make it better for those around us. Yeah, well, well, well said. Um, with respect to that, then, what do you think the role is that business leaders who care, and I do think it's up to the business leaders, um, to lead the way in how things are going to are going to happen for community 
Um, so what do you think their role is in ensuring that people in their companies are taking, their well-being is taken care of in terms of financial, physical, and mental to, and yeah. realize that it is good for business to take care of that and it's good for the community as well. I think leaders must play a very active role in supporting their teams during this time. I mean, like I said, this pandemic has upended so many people's lives. I think about even some of the individuals who um, work with and for me, they have, you know, some of them are single parents, some of them are being teachers during the day, working at night, they're trying to deal with so many different things. Um, and I think the pandemic has exacerbated gender inequalities. There's a lot of studies out there about this too. It's definitely disproportionately affecting women who are getting laid off, furloughed at a much higher pace than men are, working mothers in particular. I mean, they already sort of bared some of the child and family care responsibilities. Now it's even worse if you're a working mother. So I think in, in this environment that we're in, it's so important for leaders to find a way to uh, engage their employees, deal with productivity, help them collaborate, innovate, despite all of the challenges. But the most important thing is putting our people first and making sure that we're checking in on their emotional well-being, of course, and then also asking about their financial well-being and, and all of those different types of things. Um, I remember a couple months ago, I was watching CNN and I, I saw Chris Cuomo on and he said, you know, people are going to remember you for what you did during this time and what you didn't do during this time. And it's something I've been thinking a lot about as, um, you know, I have people working for me 20 years from now, they think back on what their manager was like or what their friend was like or what their sister was like. It's just so important for us to all put our best foot forward during this time of need and, um, you know, also help the teams be agile. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to help my team think about how do we think about what the outcomes are and then every day adapt and prioritize what matters most because it is rapidly changing right now. Yeah, I think that's, that's brilliant. You know, I always compare things really quick to, to sports and the, um, you know, when the coach argues against the referee, you know, defending their player, even if they're going to win or lose that argument, the player always sees that the coach stood up for them and will do anything for that coach later. Um, yeah. And the same thing applies to, to work, I think. Um, and almost in a sense, like going back to what's their purpose or, you know, being proud of where you work. To your point, exactly, people will remember what you did. And, um, and it'll, come, it'll come through in droves, positive droves um, later. So, um, so you do see this then, obviously it's a hard, challenging time. You do see this as a major opportunity as well to make dramatic change in, in where we are, right? I do. I think the question is, how do we capitalize on this moment in time and turn it into an actual movement, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there's so many learnings that we're having. I mean, a lot of businesses have digitally transformed overnight and we're having to figure out how to operate in a new environment. And there's a lot of cost savings with that too. You, you look in the news and see how many different companies like Twitter, et cetera, who have said, we're actually gonna be working from home forever. Why do we have all these giant corporate real estate leases when we found that we're actually productive working from home and people appreciate the flexibility. So I think we're gonna see some big societal differences and changes. and. Um, we have to just sort of think about how we want to adapt and what's the goodness that we've gotten from this. And I know a lot of people are struggling, so I don't want to boast uh, my personal experience. But for me, I mean, I have been so fortunate over the past four months. I feel like in many ways it was sort of a blessing in disguise. I got a chance to spend uh, four months in Colorado with my mom. I literally can't remember the last time I had that kind of uninterrupted time with family. It's probably been over a decade. I was sleeping better. I was eating home cooked food. I was exercising. I mean, I was working a lot. I still am, but I just feel like I've been able to get a lot of balance in my life. And I know not everybody is in that position. They're, they're a lot more stressed during this time period, but I think everybody has to just sort of adjust and see uh, you know how to take advantage of this time to hopefully work on yourselves or or maybe even use it as an opportunity to have a pivot because um i've been coaching some people who are thinking about career changes or maybe unfortunately lost their jobs and i said 
you know, maybe this is actually an opportunity for you to think about what really gives you energy. What do you want to do? And, and how do you want to sit down and prioritize what's important to you? So, um, like I said, I mean, I think this is going to be a hugely defining moment in a lot of people's lives. Yeah, things happen for a reason, don't they? They sure do. And this, this could be it. So thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, great insights, great conversation. And um, I'm noticing we've got similar mirrors also, kind of <laughs> in the background. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's a good chance for us to, uh, you know, mirror off of what each of us said and, um, and learn from it. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me.